as for that song. How good it is to be back in the house of the Lord. How good it is to be back with God's people. I can't tell you how blessed I've been, Pastor Jim, to ask me to fill in for him today while he's away. What a blessing it is to come back to Miles Road. And before we start, I just want to tell you how much we miss you guys. We're out and about and going here, there, and yon. But just so you know, you go with us everywhere we go. You're in our hearts, you're in our minds, and you're in our prayers. When I was listening to the song that was just being sung, I think back to a life so many years ago where I was broken, where I was desperate, where God came to me and he reached down and he picked up those broken pieces and he began to put them back together. And that should be each one of us who knows Jesus as Lord and Savior. As the foundation for your life, you know the day that he reached out and he saved you. So what do we do when we come together in corporate worship? What do we do on Sunday morning? How do we come in? Well, let's start off. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds. This is free. We'll get into John here in a minute. He made known his way to Moses. He acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great, so great, is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. I just want to thank God today for the day he removed my sins as far as the east is from the west. Is there anyone else that wants to thank God for the life that you have today? I mean, good gracious, we could sit here and we could look at the world, we could look at everything that's going on around us and we could be singing the woe is me's, but as a believer we're able to stand here today and proclaim that Jesus is Lord, and to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's coming back for us, and he's going to take us to be with him one day. We sing of that. We sing of the day we get to heaven. <coughs> we sing of the time that we're going to see his face. But do you realize, you can walk with him today, you don't have to look down the road. We do know what's coming down the road, but we know what's happening today. And we know the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. And we know that Jesus gave us this spirit and he says, I will be with you, I will be in you, and I will never leave nor forsake you. So as we walk in this world today in the midst of all this mess, you're not alone. The Lord Jesus is walking with you. And you hold on to that. You hold on to that foundation of who Jesus is, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he has promised to do. That's what we have to look forward to. That's why we can get up every morning and look out into the world and see the beauty of God and know that we're going to be able to go out and experience him. If you'll turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. 
we'll read of the foundation of life. The Word of God says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him, speaking of Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then verse 14 reads, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that we can open up your scripture and we can see and hear your heart, see and hear your words. And Lord, feel your arms wrap around us. Father, we thank you for the day that you saved us. Lord, we thank you for the day that we became your child. And Father, we pray today that you draw us near to you. Father, I pray that you block out every distraction this morning. And as we look to you, Father, you feel the need within our lives, Lord, because you are the only one that can fill it. And Father, we thank you for what you're going to do here today. And Lord, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for all you've done, you are doing, and you are going to do. For it's in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. I get excited. If I didn't, I have no life. I get excited at the opportunity to come into God's house. I get excited <coughs> to, be, to be able to walk into these doors because I know that God is going to do something supernatural. I know he's going to reach out. He's going to touch hearts. When you look around and, and you see how God has touched so many lives. It's just amazing. And that's why it is so good to be with God's family, with God's people, because you see the miracles that have been worked within lives. So as we come together, we come together for one reason. We come together to praise our Lord and Savior. We come together to worship. We come together to bless God and to bless the family of God because he has given us one another. We're here. You're a gift to the person sitting next to you. You're an important part of this church. Each one here, you have to understand that you are needed here and in the kingdom of God. Don't ever think that you don't have anything to give to someone because you do. Each one of us do. So we come together and we praise the Lord Jesus. We come together and we thank him for the life he has given us. We thank him for the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary because it was one drop of that blood that cleansed a sinner and made him whole. It was one drop of that blood that brought people from death into life. Whenever we get up in the morning, I know it was harder this morning because you had to spring forward an hour. So as the good people we were, we set our clocks up at 7 o'clock last night or so and said, wow, it's already 8, 8.30 man, we better get ready to go to bed. We've got to get up in the morning. Thinking about that, thinking about getting up, thinking about being able to come into God's house, thinking about <coughs> being able to see and to experience the miracles he was going to perform, expecting to come into his presence. I want to ask you a question. Why did you come into church today? Because it's what you do on Sunday? No. You come to church to worship our Heavenly Father. We come together to fellowship with one another, to edify one another, to lift one another up, to lift up the name of our Lord. That's why we're here. And when we lift up His name, 
The power of the Spirit rains down and fills from within and gives us what we need. When we look at the world around us and we see everything that's going on, we have to realize that we're living in dangerous times. We're living in times where things can change in a moment. Do you realize, with every breath you take, God has given you a gift? He's given you a gift of being able to breathe. For every second that you're alive, for every beat that your heart squeezes, do you realize that God has given you that gift? He's in control of everything. And within a millisecond, everything could change. Within a millisecond, your heart could quit beating. Within a millisecond, your lungs could quit breathing. And within a millisecond, you could go from sitting here in a pew in Somerville to standing before God. Do you understand that? We all need to know that, that one day we are going to stand before God and one day we are going to have to give account of our life. Are you ready? Are you ready for that day? I pray that we all are. So whenever we look at the world that's outside. We look out the windows and I know the sun's going to be shining. It's been beautiful these last few days except for the rain the other day. But you see the sun shining. You see the beauty of the world. But I want to stress one thing this morning. The beauty of the world and all the world has to offer is nothing in comparison with what the Lord Jesus Christ can give you. Nothing. Whenever you look at people that grasp the things of the world, you see that they're falling for the hype, they're falling for the entertainment, they're falling for the moment. But when you look at Jesus, you have to understand, yes, Jesus is for this moment, but he is also for all eternity, forever and ever. So when we look at what the world has to offer and know that it's just for a moment and then we compare that with what Jesus has to offer, how can people turn away? How can people take the world, its glitz and its glamour over what Jesus has to offer? Jesus offers no hype. He offers no entertainment. The only things Jesus offers are deliverance from sin, hmm, forgiveness, a new life, the love of God, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and an eternity with him in heaven. Hmm. So which should I choose? The bling of the world or the promises of Jesus? So when we look at that, when we draw contrast between the two and we look at what the world has to offer in comparison with what Jesus is offering, I really have a hard time understanding why people can choose the world over Jesus. Yet people do that every day. Every single day they do. And it's sad that many of these people will suffer an eternity in hell because they are too proud, they are too full of themselves that they won't surrender their pride and admit they need a Savior, which we all do and we all did. And we all had to come to that point of brokenness where we realized that we couldn't do, only God could do. And we surrendered it to him. A few minutes ago, we sang the song, When We All Get to Heaven. That's a song for believers. 
That's a song for those who know Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's a song that so many people sing thinking they're all right, religious people sing. But when you read the scripture, when you read the Bible, you understand that all people will not be going to heaven as some people teach. The word of God says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator, also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. As we read those verses, as we listen to the Holy Spirit speak to us, we see the plan of God for all people who will reach out to him for salvation, for the gift of eternal life. As we read these verses, we see that it is God's desire that all men be saved and come to understand the truth of Jesus. Not a certain few, not this particular group, or this group, or that group, or another group, but all people come to a knowledge of the truth. And as we read this, people will say, well, what is the truth? What is the truth? But better yet, who is the truth? Who is the truth? Is the truth in Washington? Is the truth in Columbia? Is the truth in Rome? No. The truth is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the truth. <coughs> Jesus is the one who paid the ransom that we might have eternal life. Jesus is the one who brings us into the presence of God because of the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary. Jesus is the one who tells God that we're his children. I've covered their sin. Jesus is the one who gives us all things abundantly. And as we read this verse, we see that Jesus is the one who was sent into this world at the perfect time and the perfect place to take on the sin of man and nail it to the cross of Calvary, pay the price for each one of us. Jesus is that one to suffer and die for us so that we might live eternally with him. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The way, the truth, the life. No other way to heaven, no other way to God than through the cross, through Jesus. So when we look at the Bible and we, and we read, we see that Jesus came into this world to seek and to save the lost and the dying. However, men love the darkness more than they love the light. Why do people not want to go into the light? Because their sins are, are brought out and we see. Why do people not pray for the Holy Spirit to search us and show us where we come short of the glory of God? Because we don't want to deal with what we're trying to hide from everyone. We should pray every day. Lord, search me. Search me and show me where I come short of your glory. And Lord, bring me to repentance. Take it out, Father, so you can be glorified through my life. We should pray that every day. People of Jesus' day heard his teachings. They saw him heal the blind, the deaf, the lame. They saw him raise the dead, but they still denied him. They still walked away. They still loved the darkness more than they loved the light. But one day, 
in the days coming when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So when we look at these words, we see what Jesus has done for us, we see what Jesus is doing now, and we see the promises of what he is going to do in the future. And we understand how, as a believer, Jesus is that foundation of our life that we build on, that we continue to grow in our relationship with the Lord. But he's not only the foundation for our life, Jesus is the foundation of the universe, and he's the foundation of the church, and he's the foundation of our families, or he should be. Whenever you open your Bible and you read, you read here in John verse 4, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then you go down to verse 12 and you read, But as many as received him, now listen to this, this is coming from God through the Holy Spirit to us through the Apostle John. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So when you read and you understand these words, you see how we became children of God, how we were reborn into the family of God, not by our will, but by God's will and by what Jesus did on the cross. I love reading John's writing because he makes it simple so I can understand it. And when you read these writings, you see the simplicity of life and death. Life is described as light, and death is described as darkness. Before you came to salvation, before you were reborn, you were walking in darkness. You were walking in the death of the world. Do you remember that time? Do you remember when you walked in darkness and then you remember the time where you had no hope, you had no life, you had no joy, and the only promise you had was eternity in hell? But God, my favorite two words in the Bible, but God had a plan for our lives. One day, the light of God shined into your darkness, into my darkness, and one day is also today. If you're walking in darkness today, I want you to know that the light of God can shine right into that and run that darkness away. All you need to do is yield to him and say, Lord, deliver me from this darkness. But on that day, God's light shined into your life and the darkness fled you receive Jesus as your personal Savior. And on that day, you walked out of death and darkness into the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. On that day, you got a song placed in your heart where you can sing hallelujah to the Lord for what you have done, for the praise and the honor and the glory. I'm going to ask you, do you remember that day? Do you remember the day when your life was forever changed? Do you remember the day when your old ways of life died? Do you remember the day when the old person became dead and a new person was raised to life? Do you remember that day? Do you remember the day when Jesus wiped away all your sins and he cast them out as far as the east is to the west? Do you remember that day? If not, today can be that day. But more importantly, do you remember the day he became your foundation? Do you remember the day when he began molding and making you into the person that he wants you to be? Do you remember the day 
whenever you couldn't wait to come into his presence. You couldn't wait to open your Bible and read. You couldn't wait to pray. You couldn't wait to come into the house of God and meet with other people because you knew God was going to work in great ways. Do you remember that day? I'm going to ask you one more question. Are you living in that day or are you living in today? Are you living in a day where you grasp all of that? You remember what God did. You remember the day you were saved. You remember the day when your sins were washed away. And you live today on that foundation, walking with Jesus, stronger, more faithful, trusting him whenever the whole world's caving in around you because you see what he's done. Are you living in that way today? Are you living in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ? Is everything his? Can you raise your hands and say, Lord, you've given me this life. Lord, I give it back to you. Use me however you want. Can you live there? As we look at our lives and we ask the Holy Spirit to examine us, we have to look at this person that stands in my mirror every morning and when I look at him, I have to honestly say, Charles, are you living today to bring glory to God in everything that you are going to do? Are you living to bring glory to God in everything that you say? Are you living to bring glory to God everywhere you go? That should be our desire. That should be our desire as a believer. So when we look at these type of questions and we need to look at them every day, they're hard to face. They're hard to grasp hold to sometimes. But when we do, it will drive us to our knees and say, Lord, help me. Help me in this day because you have given so much to me. Lord, help me to give back to you when you look at your life do you see the joy that you had on the day you were saved do you see the joy welling up within each other or toward each believer that joy that just exudes and comes out you know there's nothing worse than seeing a professing Christian who's lost their joy they've lost their way and you have to ask, what happened? A lot of times, people want to blend in with the world more than they want to stand apart for God. It's sad to say, but you see that in many of our churches today. They want to blend in with the world more than they want to stand on the word of God. A second reason you can be devoid of joy, peace, and power is because this person, the individual, puts themselves ahead of serving God. And you serve self and become self-centered. You become the center of your universe instead of having the Lord Jesus there. But the main reason professing Christians live a lackluster life is because they have become the foundation for their life instead of standing on Jesus, standing on him. So when we look at our lives, we have to see where we are. Where am I standing this morning? Where are you standing this morning? Is Jesus the foundation that you're standing on? Are you standing in your own strength and your own power? I'm going to tell you something. You've already 
experienced this, I know. But if you stand in your own power, it's inevitable that you are going to fall into the ways of the world because we can't do it. We can't do it on our own. We need the strength of the Lord Jesus. We need the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to stand when the winds of this world began to blow against us. Whenever we understand this, whenever we understand that whenever I start weaving away, I need to come back to where God wants me to be. The foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was speaking to Peter. He was speaking to the disciples. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus said these words. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his, his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon and Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. The Lord immediately acknowledged Peter's confession and identified the source of his inspiration as coming from God. In these verses, in these words, Jesus called Peter Barjona to illustrate his confession was true because Jesus was as truly and is as truly the Son of God as Peter was the son of Jonah. When we look at that, when we look at this passage, we remember that Jesus was talking to the disciples who were Hebrews, so they were grounded in the scripture of the Old Testament, and they would know that the Old Testament, the word rock is never used to describe a man. It's only used in the description of God and of Christ. We read in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. Who, who, he who believes in it will not be disturbed. In Psalm 118, 22, we read, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So in these verses, Jesus, Jesus Christ is described as the foundation of, or the cornerstone in Isaiah 28, 16. And he is described as the rejected stone in Psalm 128, verse 118, verse 22. But in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 31, we read, Indeed, their rock is not like our rock. Even our enemies themselves judge this. So when we look at these words and we see this, Jesus wasn't trifling with symbols. He brought to the disciples what they understood, what they understood about deity. When we read in Deuteronomy 32, 32, 31, as the rock, speaking of God, and declared, upon this rock, upon God, upon himself as God, I will build my church. And what is the church? The church is us. The church is all believers. The church is all believers throughout the world. And upon this rock, upon God, upon Jesus Christ, I have built my church. I have laid the foundation. And nothing in this world, nothing, the gates of hell cannot come against it. They will fall. So we have to understand that as believers, as the church, as a body of Christ, we are set firmly on the foundation of the rock who is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are set firmly on the rock who is God. So when we look at this and we understand it, <coughs> we know that there's nothing this world can do to take us down. 
what Jesus is saying in verse 18. I will build my church, and he has, and he is, and he will, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I'm going to close with this. In that verse, I want you to understand a couple things. That neither Satan, nor his demons, nor his minions, nor anything that he throws at us are a match for the spirit-born, spirit-built church of God. When we look at that, when we look at ourselves, since we are spirit-filled believers in Christ and we're members of the spirit-filled church that was founded on the rock of God, you will not be overcome by anything Satan has to throw at you because you, as a believer, belong to God. And that's his promise. You will not be overcome by the world. All you have to do is put your left foot down, put your right foot down, and stand on the rock that God has put you on, the rock of Jesus Christ. But how many times do we fail to do that? Many times. Many times. So when we look at this, we look at our lives, we look at where we are, we look at our roles, our families, we're the spiritual leaders within the church. We're the spiritual leaders of our household. It's our responsibility that our families stand on the foundation of Jesus. We're to instruct, we're to teach, we're to live in front of them what it means to be saved, what it means to be led by the Spirit. So as believers, we not only need to know the Word, we need to live the word every day of our life, every hour. When we look at what God has given us, when we look at what we have, the only thing we can say is thank you, Lord, for what you've done. When we look at these verses, we see that God is the foundation of the universe and everything in it. Jesus is the giver and the foundation of life. The foundation of the church is the rock of the Father and the Son through the power of the Spirit, all united as one. And the indwelling Holy Spirit gives us the power we need to overcome the temptations of life and stand firmly against the wiles of Satan. So as individuals, as families, as a church body, we're to stand on the foundation on the, of the truth that has been given to us by God. We don't listen to the false teachers of the world. We listen to what God has given us. If we do, if we do and we do not falter, then we're able to stand against all the forces Satan can muster. Does anybody here believe Satan's defeated? I do. I know he is. He was defeated at the cross and the grave. He's shooting pop guns. He's got nothing, nothing compared to the power of the Spirit that lives within us. So we need to understand, and I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you today to live and the power of the Spirit that lives within you. Because on the day of your salvation, the fulfillment of the promise that Jesus gave the disciples when he told them he was going to send the Spirit and the Spirit would live within them, he would lead them in everything. The same Spirit that led the disciples is the same Spirit that indwelt you on the day that you were saved. And the promise is that he will be in you and with you forever. Stand on that promise. Hold on to that promise to know that God is with you every moment of the day. And we're able to walk. And we're able to live the life God has called us to live. So I'm going to ask you,
Who's your foundation this morning? Is Jesus your foundation? If so, then you praise God for what he's doing. If you have fallen back and you have taken on the role as foundation in your life, I pray that in these next few moments you'll ask for forgiveness and ask God to move you out of the way and bring the Spirit back to lead you. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I pray you call upon him today. The promise of the word says he'll not cast anyone away. He will welcome all who come to him and he will receive you and he will save all those who call upon his name. And we thank God for that. We thank God for the promises that he's given us in his word. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment as we pray.